record on this. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Pages to Progress. We are about to dive into a very special episode. Throughout this whole series, we've been focusing on the book that John is holding up, Saying No to God by Matthew J. Cortman. And different to other episodes of Pages to Progress, we're incredibly privileged to be able to welcome into our conversation the author himself, Matthew J. Cortman. So I'm going to take some time to invite him into the room now as the technology kind of catches up. We're going to welcome him um, forward. We're really grateful to have this opportunity. Um, Matthew, if you're there, if you can turn on your video, we'd love to welcome you to Pages to Progress. Hi, Matthew. Thanks for taking that time to be with us. Um, I want to introduce you formally, Matthew, to John, to Dee, to George, um, and to myself, Sam. Welcome and thanks for being with us, Matthew. How are you doing? You okay? I'm great. No, thank you so much for bringing me on here. It feels a little surreal having watched the YouTube videos of all of you and then I'm watching my screen and seeing me on such a YouTube video. It's just weird. It's kind of like a deja vu, like, wait a minute, I don't belong here. <laughs> well, you do. Well, you do because um, um, whether you experience it or not, we've actually been talking to you for the past however long, six weeks. Um, maybe not with a response from you, but we've been in conversation with you because of the book. Uh, first and foremost, Matthew, I just want to thank you for, for taking it upon yourself um, to, to take on the challenge of writing a book like this. I'm going to be very real and say it was challenging. <laughs> it was challenging definitely to, to my faith. Um, you ruptured a couple of spleens in me. <laughs> it's not the uh, intention. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you also helped to, to really just open out some holes that needed to be filled by, by intentional questionings led by the Holy Spirit. That's my, those are my conclusions, and I'm sure everyone else on this call will give their own conclusions. We have a very difficult job, Matthew, um, because the purpose of, of today's session is to essentially put you on the spot, <laughs> on the docks, if you were, um, and we wanted, to, we wanted to be able to pose some questions to you to get some honest responses. Um, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give a chance for each individual on, on, on here to give a, a, a brief um, introduction and, and if they want to say some words. But each of us have some questions that we'd love to give you. Uh, we have a million questions. <laughs> Let's but, see how much, how fast we can get through them. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we can, we will see what we can do. I'll so, do my best to answer any questions you have. Great. And if you answer them wrong, then we'll ensure you get the sack from your job. <laughs> <laughs> but, it is recorded, so <laughs> there's nothing hidden here. No problems, no problems. So saying no to God, Matthew, was, was in my perspective, a book that taught us to battle with the challenge with with the notion of challenging the heart of god and being obedient to god that was in my perspective one of the major themes that came out i'm going to hand over to start off with joe uh, the reason why i'm starting off with you joe because i know you have a question that's related to the opening of matthew's premise in the book and I'd love you to be able to go into that. Um, I know you have a question in regards to Abraham. Is that correct, Joe? Correct, I do. Uh, can I ask, I just want to make a comment before sure. uh, Joe starts. I just want to say that I really enjoyed listening <laughs> to your discussion uh, all these weeks. Uh, you have all raised really great questions. Uh, you've, you've honestly made me reflect on all the flaws that my much younger self, when I wrote this in undergrad, uh, created while writing and exploring this book. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I've appreciated every comment that you've given from your heartfelt reading. It's been very helpful and made me reflect on a lot of things. I just want to say that before you all give your awesome. questions, just to let you know, I look forward to them, honestly. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Likewise, uh, you know, I, uh, it has, I'd like to echo Pastor, you know, the, this book has, has, um, uh, has been very interesting, very exciting, very kind of uh, um, uh, eye awakening for many reasons. And uh, uh, I wanna thank you for being here to, to answer some of our questions and I appreciate your uh, willingness to answer it uh, uh, today. 
So uh, thank you, Pastor, for letting me start off with the, with a question. The question has to do with Abraham, um, because I think that was kind of a key figure at the very beginning where as you, as you kind of relayed your interpretation of, um, of, of scripture, of his kind of dynamic with God, his challenge with God, his, his fighting back, you know, I think you used the word, you know, to, to, to question God and ultimately God allowing Abraham to do that uh, for, um, I guess, a, to try to allow to build his faith and build his trust. So, but I'd like to go ahead and uh, maybe paraphrase some of your quest, your your statements, if you don't mind. So that way we can, you can answer that way. And then uh, uh, afterwards, I'd like to maybe pose a different perspective and maybe your thoughts on that. Uh, your, uh, the perspectives are not my own. It, it, it's a perspective from Ellen G. White. And, it, and it's fair to say that, you know, Pat, uh, Matthew, you, you, you come from the same background as we do, I guess, right? You're the Seventh-day Adventist. So Ellen G. Mm -hmm. White is no stranger to you. And you've, ref you've referenced her several times in the Bible, uh, in your book. Okay, so and let's just clarify: it's not the Bible, but yeah. Let's just... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I'll be honest; I've never had. I was so happy to have uh, lots of non-Adventists who, a lot of them, have read the book. They're like, "Yo, this Ellen White girl, like she's <laughs> she's pretty cool. Like, uh, this is really interesting. I should look into her. I never, I, I'd heard her name, but I didn't realize she, she had these ideas and stuff I'm like that." <laughs> Okay. Well, cool. The the chapter um, where you talk about here, and, and again, I'm referencing I, uh, again. If you have your book, uh, you know your Kindle version as well. The Kindle numbers pages are a little bit different from the book, so uh, you probably know where this is. Uh, it's on Abraham saying no to God, mm. and uh, where uh, in in page sixty eight of my uh, Kindle side it says by telling Yahweh that he's not acting just, uh, which meant that. Uh, uh, God was failing to do what a uh, God should do. Abraham is threatening that perhaps he should look for another God. And the after mentioned Psalm um, 82, the judgment against gods that fail to act as they should is replacement. This isn't simply a plea by Abraham to God. It's a veiled threat. Okay. You kind of like uh, uh, perhaps present, hey, God, uh, you know, and, and I think you offer us a reference like they're playing chicken, right? They come out one at each other and saying, who's going to, to, to give up, right? I remember that analogy very well. Um, and, and then and further down it says, in other words, the original Hebrew of Genesis 18, 22 appeared to suggest that as the story began, Ab uh, before Abraham began uh, to vent his frustrations at God, Yahweh stood before Abraham as a student would stand before a teacher. Basically, uh, God humbled himself to be taught by Abraham. I think that was uh, uh, your quote there as well. And then uh, further later on, you, you do explain this dynamic between them. And, and, and as, the, as you explained, this is what you said. You said, to answer the strange riddle, in my opinion, is that God was testing Abraham. And I think many people would agree, uh, even Andrew White, that God was testing Abraham's faith. He was testing his faith. He was testing uh, uh, if it was strong enough, secure enough, and motivated enough to fight back, to fight against God. Abraham, after all, is not condemned, frowned upon, or diminished as a man of faith because of, ex of this exchange with God. Rather, his faith is strengthened, not because he ultimately trusted God, he didn't, in parentheses, not because he accepted God's will, parentheses, he didn't, but because he faced God's will, resisted, and in a sense, won. Although we will return to examine this story again much later, and you referenced Abraham you know, several other times in several chapters, let's look at two other stories that appear to reveal a similar pattern throughout scripture. And so, uh, uh, and that's, you remember those, obviously, uh, uh, this picture of Abraham really struggling with God, playing chicken, saying, you know what, God, I know you better than this. And, and part of that was, uh, you know, um, you know, the story of, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And then later on, you, sh you show us the picture of, of, uh, of, of the sacrifice, right, uh, of, of Isaac. And so it was really interesting to see this perspective because I had never seen it that way, to be honest with you. But I'd like to share with you, uh, you know, a different perspective. And that perspective comes from um, uh, Ellen G. White, right? And I, I think this is where I'd like to go ahead and share with you. Uh, and, and again, I'll just share some brief statements from Ellen G. White. It says this, and this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, a, a book that she wrote about all these uh, uh, great figures, Abraham being one. And this is her dialogue. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you're, you're familiar with this, this perspective. And it says this, Satan was at hand to suggest 
that he must be deceived. The one who's deceiving him or tempting him is actually Satan. He, he heard the voice from God and that voice, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, thou lovest, thou command, that command must be obeyed. And he dared not delay this urgency. No question. He knew that voice he had to obey going forward. Satan was near to whisper doubts and unbelief. So my question is, who is this that's creating this doubt and disbelief? But Abraham resisted his suggestions. And when he saw Mount Moriah, he knew that the voice which she had spoken to him was from heaven. He knew at that point that it was God's voice, not some delusion that Satan was thinking that he had. He did not murmur against God, Ellen Joyce says. He dwelt on the evidence of the Lord's goodness and faithfulness, and he repeated the promise, Isaac will be countless as the sea, grains of the sand. And then it says here, Abraham grasped the divine word, accounting that God was able to raise him even from the dead. Right? We know that his struggle. But yet none but God could understand how great was the father's sacrifice in yielding up his son. And I'd like at this point, real quickly, and I'll wrap this up, is to elevate this whole scenario even higher. The question is, why would God do something like this, which he would never have normally asked anybody else to do, killing his son, which was what all the pagans did, right? And I'd like to suggest this, that there was a reason why God did test him, that Abraham did obey uh, without doubting, that there was this not pushback or playing chicken, but he obeyed to a certain point, because this is when he was 120 years old, much years later after he had messed up several times and the whole universe and even Satan was saying, he doesn't deserve to have this covenant with you, God. He has not trusted you. And God is giving him one final chance. Do you obey me or not? And he mm -hmm. says this, but Isaac had been trained because its whole point was Isaac was also in, you know, was tempted to, to flee or did he yield? And it talks about, and I won't go to uh, uh, Isaac because he honored his father and he honored God. Uh, I won't go to that paragraph. Real quickly, and again, thanks for, for giving me this extra time, Pastor. On Mount Moriah, God uh, renewed his covenant. By myself I have sworn, said Jehovah, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in the blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. He gave another covenant again. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Okay. And then it goes here to say, Abraham's great act of faith stands like a pillar of light, illuminating the way for God's servant in all succeeding ages. And she even goes to say, and the whole universe was watching. And it was even a lesson point that finally it clicked to the angels because they did not understand what this whole plan of salvation was until they saw this act that Abraham went through with his son, Isaac, who in a sense was like Christ himself, right? And ultimately at the end, it says here, but he did not, Abraham, stop to question the promise that could be fulfilled in Isaac. He knew that God is just and righteous, and he obeyed the command to the very letter. It's very like, wow. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him as righteousness, and that's why he was a friend of God. And then finally here, let's say here, go ahead. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as the test of faith that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony was permitted so that he might understand from his own experience the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. No other test could have done this. God gave his son, who ultimately did die. There was no, you know, you know there was no replacement for Jesus, right? And then finally, this last paragraph is this. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of the succeeding, but it was, a, it was for the sinless intelligences of heaven and other worlds. It was a lesson book for the universe. That's why I'd like to take this you know, story to that level. There must have been a reason why God did that. And my question always, why did God do or ask things to do, which seems in, all, in our culture today, as, as murder, as something that's genocide. That doesn't make sense. But if we were to step back and then Ellen G. White peels, you know, that layer back and says, this is the reason why it is done. This is the reason why it wasn't. And again, I believe she was inspired and 
we can ask that another time if what your position on Ellen Jawai is, but it says it was to open more fully the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. To me, I was like, wow. You know, I won't, I won't, I won't say it anymore. But that to me was the scheme. What I'd like to do is, how do you portray the in in, in your past experiences with Ellen White's interpretation and and how you do this because it was it was very important for me because it rocked me at the very beginning you know that potential you know pushback on god and when i read had read this before and it didn't seem to connect and so that's why i'd like to present my question in its long winded way <laughs> thank you joe <laughs> over to you matthew have you got any thoughts um, reconciling oh. the two different stories Plenty. I mean, I didn't get asked this when I did the Loma Linda Savas School lecture, which if you're curious, Joe, you can um, watch. It's on YouTube, but it's like it's like two hours spent on this story. Um, but, so you know, I can go a while for sure. And we didn't even get to the topic of Ellen White uh, in order to talk that long. So there's there's actually a point that can be raised in regards to your point. Uh, so let me try to tackle it in the way that I do in segments. So the first segment I'd want to say is, I remember when you mentioned that quote that you read from me about uh, he didn't ultimately believe in God's will. He, that quote by me, I remember when you read it and, and when I was hearing it, I was like, man, that escaped my proof edits. Um, and, and the reason why is because it doesn't make it very clear in the current draft. So if there's ever like a five-year anniversary edition or something, I'm going to go back there and change it. It doesn't make it clear that what I mean is the perceived will of God, not that he doesn't fulfill God's actual will. That's my argument is he does. It's not that he doesn't perceive what God ultimately really wants. It's that mm -hmm. he, in that moment, is faced, I'm arguing, with an image that is opposite of what God's will is, portrayed by God himself. Mm -hmm. And he has to differentiate between the perception that he's faced with and what he really knows. It's kind of like the similar thing as a wife who's always told you, I'm going to be, you know, from my own perspective, no, don't mean this in any sexist sense, but like, you know, let's say your spouse, uh, make it equal. Your spouse tells you something for 20 years, this is how they view things. Mm -hmm. Then one day you still ask, can I do this thing? And they're like, yeah, sure, go ahead. If you go ahead and say, <laughs> today's the day <laughs> let's go you're probably coming home to a shock right you're, you're supposed to perceive no nah, that doesn't make any sense Th this acceptance this go ahead is totally in contradiction to like 20 years of sustained uh messaging <laughs> i've received probably i should not be uh taking this as the true will of my spouse probably i should take the 20 years sustained belief that's my key. And if you don't get that right, then your spouse is going to go, man, we don't have a good relationship. You do not know what I've been telling you. So that's kind of a modern uh, marital illustration of the issue of perception, like in the moment, what I'm perceiving from God versus what do I know about God's character all this time? What do I know about his Torah? What do I know about his will? What do I know about his character? Or as Christians, what do I know about Christ? Okay, so just to differentiate or clarify what I meant when I was saying he doesn't obey his will, all I mean is that very statement of God appears to Abraham to want Sodom's destruction, and he rejects that and says, no, you shouldn't do that. that that's what I'm referring to in the moment, not ultimately. Okay, so that's, I always wanted to get that out, so I'm glad that you went ahead and actually <laughs> brought that quote back up again, um, brought back the feels. So then in regards to uh, the issue of Abraham, so two points I want to make in regards to biblical studies that I didn't make in the book. And the reason I didn't is I wasn't wanting, I was afraid to make any moves in chapter two that were going to derail a super edgy fundamentalist, inerrantist, King James only kind of individual if they were reading. And that would be like, to point out anything about the past that biblical scholarship currently knows that might blow someone's mind a little too much. And then it would distract them from anything else the chapter was saying. So one of those points was I never brought up Hebrews. And the reason I never brought up Hebrews, and I've had at least four or five people ever always bring up Hebrews, 
is because it would necessitate pointing out it's wrong. And every scholar, including Adam, just knows it's wrong. And this is not surprising. The Bible itself reveals it's wrong. So, and it's understandable why it got it wrong. So Hebrews imagines that Abraham already has a belief in resurrection. And this was an old idea that Protestants mm. thought as well. Um, and it stayed a long time. But in fact, scholars have largely figured out over the past 50, 70 years that the idea of resurrection never existed in Israel until the second temple period, until way after the canon was getting finalized. Only then it seems that some prophets in Judea began to get the understanding, like Daniel, uh, of this new thing called resurrection. Because if you read the book of Job, for example, Job clearly states there is no resurrection. You die and that's it. Ecclesiastes, same thing. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, Israel did not have a, a, the same kind of concept of the afterlife um, that the later Judeans do. Now, what happens is, is that you fast forward that many hundreds of years with people who grow up in the resurrection context, it becomes orthodoxy. Duh, of course there's a resurrection, right? So Hebrews grows up in this kind of, uh, you know, milu, where it just understands that it makes sense to Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, whoever it was, it makes sense. Oh yeah, of course he would have thought of this possibility. But Abraham, and even if we take like, for people who are like, well, how do you know if it's really historically accurate? Okay, whatever. If you're like that, you want to go that route. Uh, the author of Genesis, okay, no matter which way you go, there was no belief in resurrection. So the audience is listening to Genesis 22. Um, Abraham himself and the writer all lacked an idea of the resurrection concept as we now have it and as Daniel had it. So as such, when you read Genesis 22, it's anachronistic to assume as Hebrews that he would have hold on, he would held on to that promise. Mm -hmm. So we know, and that's not controversial at all, that that's just not possible for the original audience who first heard the story. They would not have been able to hear it that way. So at the very least, even if let's say, imagine Abraham did have it that way, that's not the intention of the Bible writer. He didn't think of that when he wrote the story and preserved it. That's not how Israelites heard the story and preserved it and thought of it. The other thing is, I'm trying to remember all the points, right? When people try to make the idea that Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac is so huge, they're just making a pagan argument and it's not as good as they think. So lots of different pagan religions, especially in Phoenicia and other places, did practice child sacrifice. The Moabites practiced a child sacrifice. In fact, there was an account in the Bible of the king of Moab in a battle with the Israelites having sacrificed a son. And according to the Bible writer, it was effective. It ended the war. They lost because he killed his son and it was effective. That This was very much believed in the ancient world that offering up the single most important thing would achieve the military or blessing that you wanted because it was the best gift you could give. But the problem with it is, is for us, it's immoral. Back then it was considered problematic, but it was considered that God was so high or the gods are so high that of course only the best would satisfy them. It's, it's the best, so you have to give the best. Even in the Bible, um, when you look, I think it's in Leviticus, it will describe Yahweh saying, um, you know, the, the Levites have been uh, substituted for your children. Like, mm -hmm. I would want to kill all your kids, but no, um, I'll take the Levites as consecrated servants in their stead, <laughs> right? That's obviously not what God really thinks. But nonetheless, that's like the way the wording in which those Israelites early on understood from their culture. Like, of course, the gods want the best in our children. So there must be an explanation for why Yahweh doesn't. Uh, but obviously, this develops over time with the prophets. And the prophets come out with strong condemnations. No, there is no child sacrifice. And it's not just because God substituted or something. It is totally against God's character. In Jeremiah, it's explicit. Uh, it says, God says, it has never come into my mind at any point in time to ever ask for this, mm. ever. Not, do not attribute to me child sacrifice or the desire. Um, in fact, some people have even suggested that that's possibly in reaction to people citing Genesis 22 to Jeremiah. That, that's been a theory some have said. I mean, you can't prove it either way. 
But then Psalms has passages that say that it was child sacrifice, that the willingness to offer your children that led God to send the exile. Other passages say it was uh, offerings to demons, that any voice that claimed to be Yahweh that said, I want your son or your daughter is a demon and must be rejected. These are all texts in the Bible. And so uh, what's very convenient is to just look at Genesis 22 and be like, oh, okay, so this must be uh, the right thing and not to think, well, wait a minute, but I am supposed to know the character of God. I'm supposed to know the rest of scripture, right? The reason we're not Mormons baptizing, uh, nothing against my Mormon brothers and sisters, but the reason why the rest of Christianity doesn't tend to baptize the dead based off of a passage in 1 Corinthians is because there's nothing else we can find to really support the reasoning behind that. It kind of seems to go against the grain of everything else. Mm -hmm. So just because there's a text that seems to say something doesn't mean we all jump on board and go, yeah, let, let's follow that text. So there has to be like the cloud of witnesses, the community of the saints in the Bible, the canon as a whole has to, in a sense, build together to see the movement of the spirit. So child sacrifice runs into a problem with Abraham in the sense that it rubs against not only our own convictions now, but it mm -hmm. rubs against the actual um, convictions of the Bible writers and the prophets. And then beyond that, there's the issue of our distaste for it makes us see Abraham's challenge as so amazing. Like, wow, mm. he did that. But for Abraham, this is something that was more of, a, of a, an expected reality. Like, yeah, this does happen. Like gods do ask these things. It's not like the shock for him might be more like, but didn't God say that Isaac was supposed to be the one who was going to do this? Right. So that creates a covenant issue, kind of similar to, um, you could say, Moses, when Moses says, Lord, you can't destroy the Israelites, Exodus 32, because you made a covenant to with Abraham and the descendants to keep them going. If you destroy and, and you know, turn your back, you're you're a liar. You're breaking your promises. You don't break your promises. So you shouldn't do this in some sense. Right. You can imagine Abraham probably was struggling with that, but his willingness to kill Isaac is no different than the willingness of the king of Moab to sacrifice his son. And there's, there's, I mean, if that's the morality of it, that's kind of problematic if Abraham's just as moral as the king of Moab, who was considered <laughs> evil. At that point, you have to go, wait a minute, there must be something more, or else maybe the atheists have a point. Uh, and, and I don't think they do. So you have to sit there and go, okay, well, what else could then be going on? And so what I tried to do in the book but without making it all biblical studies, like is alluding to the fact that Abraham affirms doubts that are also promises. So he says to the servants, uh, we're coming back. That does suggest a doubt about whether or not the words God spoke are <laughs> truthful, but it also affirms a promise that Abraham believes God will keep the covenant. And so he's rejecting this idea that there's a threat God won't. The, when he tells his son, God instead will offer a lamb, right? To think that he's lying to his son, as opposed to affirming a belief in God's character, I think is a way worse uh, uh, depiction of Abraham. Uh, it's like, wow, you have two choices here to choose from. One is Abraham has such great faith in who God really is. Uh, the other is, yeah, he decided to lie to his son and <laughs> prepared to make a very very uh, uh, different kind of story happen. Now, biblical studies part aside, move on. You read Ellen White. And I think that Ellen White has, funny enough in her comments on Genesis 22, a lot in common with uh, Kierkegaard and his reading in Fear and Trembling. So what, as I understand and, and read Kierkegaard, I would say he was a philosopher who lived um, around the time period, you could say, of, of Ellen White. So it, she, they're a contemporary. I don't know that if Ellen White would have had the ability to have read him or come across his ideas, but great minds can think alike. Um, basically, Kierkegaard would argue, in my own reading, that Abraham, uh, if he just doubts God, does sin because he's doubting the words and that's it. Like he's just thinking God's not trustworthy in a sense. If that's the extent, then it becomes sin and he needs to repent. 
because essentially he's just saying, well, God's asked something hard and I don't know how to deal with it. And so I, I doubt it. So then it becomes more about his ego. And so that creates a problem. And he says that this kind of creates the, you know, the, the, the need for being a knight of resignation. You have to resign yourself to what the great ethical, the universal, the divine has told you. But then there's the knight of faith, he argues. And that's the one who believes the absurd. And Abraham, he argues, is the knight of faith par excellence because he doubts on the faith in the absurd. So, i.e., he doubts that that's God's intention, but not because of some ego, not because of some other factors. He literally doubts because it's an affirmation of a belief in who God is. And so that, but this is the absurdity. He's a human being and it's God. Mm -hmm. Who are you in your puniness to even possibly think that you understand God better than God's own words to you? And yet it's an affirmation or belief in the character that's been revealed through all the previous words that leads him to be able to express himself in faith through his doubt. Now, when we compare Ellen White talking about what Abraham was able to accomplish through what he did. Um, I think it's really important to recognize, as I pointed out in that chapter, there are two voices. There is the voice of God testing him, and it's very clear that that's the voice testing him. Uh, and then there is the voice of the angel breaking in. And I think it's very clear that theologically, you have to make a choice when reading and interpreting. When God says, I am so thankful for you that you did, that you obeyed the voice which voice is it? Because you could understand that Abraham might rightly be sitting there ready to kill his son. He sees an angel say, stop. He goes, get away from me, Satan. Thou shalt follow the word of the Lord. Mm. <laughs> right? That's a possibility right there. Yes, I'm not going to be tricked by you voice who contradicts the word of God that was given to me. God is not an author of confusion. I was told to kill Isaac. I'm going forward with it. He didn't he followed the voice of the angel and the angel's voice was in line with his convictions of what God's true purpose and desire was. So I think it, the fact that the story ends with a ram being there for him as a gift to be offered instead is an affirmation in the story from God himself that yes, Abraham, your convictions were right. This mm -hmm. was my desire. You did know mm -hmm. who I was. And so I think the, the tension or the balance here is what's remarkable historically is that someone from Moab would have no reason to doubt their God wanted a child sacrifice. They would just expect and do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Abraham really has no reason, no, nothing direct from God. He doesn't have the Torah. He doesn't have Mo a Moses Sinai event. He's been just in a relationship all these years, learning mm -hmm. and learning, I think, in particular from Sodom. People always are like, well, isn't it weird that he fought over Sodom, but his own son, he doesn't fight. Well, yeah, but that it's also different in the sense that at Sodom, he wasn't sure of who God was. Like when you watch that narrative between him and God, he begins fiery. And then it just like gets more humble, more humble, more humble. And my own theory is that the humility comes from the fact that he's looking at God and saying, whoa, I wasn't expecting this. This is okay. Okay, you're winning me back. Yeah, all right. And then in the end, right, Abraham's whole model with Sodom and Gomorrah was built on the assumption that justice only happens if God can protect the city while Lot's in it. But like he apparently never thought that it could work with like God taking the, the people who are innocent out of the city. Right. right? Like, like that, that didn't cross his mind. So in some sense, the story also reveals Abraham's own blindness about what was justice and God's willingness to work with it. And mm -hmm. it's important then to recognize that in Genesis 22, you have a lot of affirmations of trust in what God's going to do with Isaac from Abraham. And I think that reveals the difference is that when he's come to this story, he knows he has a conviction about who God is. He can't prove it, doesn't have a Bible text to cite it, but he's walked long enough to say, I don't need to fight over this. I think I'm willing to recognize and, and trust that I know how this is going to turn out. Now, the last point to make, I'd say in reaction to everything you shared, is I think it's very important that anytime that we're thinking about this 
uh, story, we have to be looking to Jesus. And you alluded to that with uh, Ellen White's comments. But the thing, funny thing is we cite Hebrews all the time and we almost never, ever cite John 8. And I put that in the beginning of the chapter for a reason, uh, even though uh, it, I, I didn't hear much of a discussion about it, because Jesus does not interpret John 8 in the way, uh, Jesus does not interpret Genesis 22 in the way that Ellen White ended up doing, which was common for her day. It was just a, a you went to any church, that's the way it would be done. If you go to any evangelical church today, that's usually the way that it's done in America. But Jesus doesn't do that. In John 8, Jesus goes ahead and argues that what made Abraham a child of God is he was not a murderer. And not only was not a murderer, but did not seek to kill. Did mm. not seek to kill. And that's pretty important because he tells mm. the Jewish leaders, you seek to kill me. You mm -hmm. seek to offer me as a sacrifice to achieve peace. Only the devil would lead you to want to kill me. Mm. And this is a challenging text because Jesus rejects the idea that Genesis 22, as interpreted as God wanting to, or needing the offering of your only son, that that applies to him mm. in the way of the Pharisees trying to use it. Yeah. And rejects the idea that that is the true message of the story. It rather has to do with, according to Jesus, the fact that he doesn't kill Isaac, that this is what epitomizes what makes Abraham who he is. So I think it's really important that in general with Genesis 22, we have to give, we have to give as much attention to Jesus's words as we do the author of the letter of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, I, at least I would think you do. Okay, and I'm going to put a full stop there. <laughs> we have we have lots to respond to what you just said and i'm hoping that a lot of that can spill over into a few other questions thank you very much matthew for sharing thank you joe joe for just offering yeah, some of those you, concepts joe. um i'm going to try i think uh, I, i've got a list of questions that we're working through i'm trying to try and work out which question to go next i think the logical segue to move from here is i think it's to move into your question d um, when I think you want to ask a question specifically, which talks about Job and, and you wanted to really question, question Matthew around his relationship with God as presented by, by Matthew in the book. Is, is, is that correct? Are you, are we referring to this whole The mini, the mini Yahweh. I'm... Oh, oh, you're referring to that one. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, by the way. Hi, <laughs> Dean. Okay, so my question is uh, around um, on chapter six, uh, page 145 to 146. I'm going to go there. And if, so on page 145, we go to the bottom, the way bottom, the last paragraph. It talks about um, how, uh, how winning a fight with creator means that we're becoming like Job. And then it goes on at the bottom that says, uh, again, again, I think talking about Job here, that when he lost his, his faith in Yahweh, he himself still continued to act as a representative of Yahweh. And it says, in essence, the next page over at the top, uh, in essence, he had come to mirror God becoming a mini Yahweh. And it goes on to say that um, in other words, a few sentences down, it says in other words, he could, he could reject God and yet still be possessed by the Holy Spirit because he continued to live out the heart of God. And I guess um, my question with this is that, um, because okay, so my understanding is that what you're saying is that even when we reject God, um, we can still be led out by the Holy Spirit. And even, even when we reject God, we, because we continue to have the heart of God, we become basically a, a demigod. I read many, I mean, many Yahweh as a demigod. And, and, and um, continue to live out the heart of God. 
So I guess I'm, I need some expansion from you as to what exactly is saying. Is this saying that, you know, yes, yes, we, we reject God and then, but we still can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, still be read, but led by him and still have a heart of God. And I guess, how do you, you know, my relationship with God and my understanding of our relationship with God has always been that we need to be constantly being in, in abiding with him and that, and that from him in separation from God, you know, we are no longer um, have the heart of God. We are no longer led by the Holy Spirit. It's, you know, it's basically rejecting God. So it's, it's confusing to me that how this can um, happen or this is how Job, and you're saying that this is how Job became? So, okay, so, oh, okay. So I actually, I was trying to figure out whether or not I had actually mentioned that in the Job chapter um, and I'm not really sure I did. And so I wonder if this is once again, one of those, it escaped the proof text, the proofreading <laughs> session, because at Yale, I went ahead and wrote two papers, uh, reinterpreting the book of Job, um, through a very close reading of, um, just a number of factors. I don't want to bore you with all the details, but one of them had to do with focusing on the role of prayer at the end of Job and how that symbolized or brought together the whole book. And that ending that you read there in that chapter six is very much drawing on that. And then I'm looking back at the previous chapter that dealt with Job, and I'm not sure that I really spelled out anything for that to directly refer back to. Maybe I did, but I'm not seeing it. So I'm worried that that was more my brain thinking that I had written something already that wasn't there. So mm. part of the issue to help explain that, since the papers haven't been published yet, um, is basically what I pointed out in the chapter that's in the book is just the extent to which Job accuses God. Um, I give lots of different quotations. Mm -hmm. Like he goes all out on God is basically the author of evil. He is the, or not the author, but he's the sustainer. He keeps it going. He is to be attributed for all the problems and uh, it, it is terrible. Nonetheless, Job keeps hoping none, all throughout uh, the best, I think, is in Job 22 he, or 23. He has this whole long speech of, if I only get to heaven, if I can only stand in the courtroom, I know the God I serve. He will not, and this is really fun, he will not come to speak to me in power. He will not wave his great arms. Around. He will not make a show of who he is to overcome <laughs> my argument. <laughs> and you come to the showdown with God, and it turns out completely... Uh, exactly the opposite of what he said that he believed god does show up does wave his arms around and goes i'm god <laughs> who are you <laughs> you're nothing um and that creates a bit of a of a dilemma and i argued in my papers that this was intentional and was uh alluded to in the prologue because in the prologue the argument from the satan is he will curse you to your face mm. not he will curse you from earth looking at some pot of shark, he will curse at your face. So in some sense, the book from the very opening warns you, it's going to come to a showdown between Job and God face to face. Mm -hmm. And that's when the test is going to really happen. Whereas most people read the story and they think to themselves, oh, well, it was already over. And now he's just sitting there kind of wallowing until God shows up and says, hey, I argued, no, that this is all part of the test. And it, the argument of the Satan to God was, Job only serves you for the fact that he thinks you are going to give him a benefit. Well, that becomes a problem because it means that the only way God would be able to answer the assault by the Satan, the argument, is Job would have to do the right thing and believe he would get no benefit for it. Mm. But the only way he could believe that is to assume or really believe that Yahweh would not bless him for doing the right thing. And if God doesn't bless, then that's not Yahweh anymore. Because Yahweh is literally defined as the God of blessings, the one who, right? So if Job has to get to a point in which he would honestly look at God and go, you're not going to ever bless me. And yet still be asked to do something, still do good, still embody who God is. 
Well, then that means that it's going to have to set up for something to happen at the end of the book. And I argued that when Snowball, sorry, it's my little dog, uh, <laughs> Pomeranian, I keep trying to bribe him with treats so he'll, he'll stop barking at the balloons. Um, so uh, I argued that when God turned, you know, throughout the, the whole thing where he says, I, I reverence myself, um, I should note that the Hebrew is actually a little ambiguous. So when he says, um, when he goes ahead and says, I think I wrote it down here. I just want to see if I can read it off if I can. Maybe I can't. Um, yes, it's right here. He goes ahead and says, sorry, um, I am a small account. No, he says, I had heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. So I, I heard you, I heard about you. Now I see you, right? So now I can confirm that I've seen you. Now, what's really interesting is there's only two possibilities there. Either I saw you and now I realize I was wrong, or I saw you and the worst has been concluded. You are exactly what I thought. And mm -hmm. now I'm worried. And of course, he, Job suffered throughout the book with two emotions. I know God's not going to speak from me from power. Oh, no, I know God is unrighteous and causing suffering in the world. And he's fighting between these two. God comes in, does nothing to distill the idea that he's not bad. In fact, he cites throughout the speeches all these animals that are violent and vicious and unclean and says, look, I made them. I made the chaos monsters, Leviathan and Behemoth. I did all that. It doesn't really do a lot to put aside uh, uh, Job's uh, feelings. And there's no point in which God says something in his speeches that contradicts any of the worst things that Job said. And then even God tells uh, the friends, Job spoke right of me. And while we might read that as both theologically correct, but it also in context sounds like he's saying, that's right, I, I kind of am a bad guy. <laughs> you know, he was right. You know, you shouldn't have been defending me it's an uncomfortable tension. Then uh, Job, of course, says, therefore, and this is where the translation part gets kind of plenty. He says, therefore, I despise myself, repent in dust and ashes. Well, therefore, I despise myself. That's pretty solid. But the Hebrew repent, it's not really, strictly speaking, repent. It means I reject what came before. Hmm. And that hmm. can apply to either Job's words, or it can apply to everything that God has said about himself, about seemingly supporting this negative view. So when God at the end turns and says, I'm going to basically wipe out your friends. I have no interest in giving mercy to them, kind of continuing this whole showdown scene with the whirlwind, and then goes ahead and tells Job, hey, I'll forgive them if you bless them, if you pray for them, if you ask me, I'll do it for them. Mind you, he's not healed Job. Job has received no healing from, at this whole time. He's not been gifted any return. He's still there, I'd argue, in this state of unknowing. And he's been told, well, who cares about you? You know, like you said, I'll probably kill you. Job says that several times in the book. Uh, but I'll spare your friends who have been totally, you know, horrible to you. As long as you actually pray for them, you'll have to be the reason that they survive. You know, you help the injustice continue. Um, Job literally at that point could be like, well, fine, if it's all nihilistic, if it's all meaningless, you're just a, a terrible bully in the sky. Why can't I be a bully? Why can't I be like, screw them? You know, they, they, they turned their backs on me. They accused me. I'm done with them. He doesn't. He acts exactly as he did in the prologue, offering mm -hmm. sacrifices, saying, I want to continue what's good. And <sighs> then it says, when he prayed for them, it's very clear, three times emphasized, when he prayed for them everything was instantly restored. Mm. And so what I argue in the papers is that that's the test in Job is it's all predicated on will he pray uh, to continue morality, even when he doesn't see in his eyes that uh, morality is uh, seemingly the end all result. Oh, you're, you know, it's like those Christians who say, well, if I wasn't going to get heaven in the end, maybe I'd kill someone. The atheists are like, what? What? <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that person. Uh, the only thing keeping you from killing me is a, is a, is a promise of a, a mansion. Uh, woo. Uh, and there are people I've met where, who, who say that, and it's scary. But the point is, is that um, that was the argument of my paper, and that was the argument that I was drawing on when I said that statement. So in context, hopefully you can understand what I meant by that. I don't think we need to do that. 
Job was a test case, a very unique one. But it does underscore, I think, that um, God, when I said mini Yahweh, I was drawing on Martin Luther, who in his writing says that the Christian purpose is to create mini Christ, that Jesus incarnates himself in our soul to create many versions of himself through us, that while imperfect, nonetheless can reveal Christ to others. That was what I meant by many Yahwehs, is this idea of us mirroring God character and being representatives of him like Abraham was. So in that sense, I'm just arguing with Job that even though Job was pushed to the edge in my argument so far that he looked at God and said, I'm not sure of my convictions, I'm surrounded by doubts. He was so convicted and convinced of God's character as being morality, that even if the image of God himself seemed to be demonic in his eyes, it would not change. He was not dedicated to that way of life, to that mm. God's character, because he was going to get a reward. He actually believed that is the right way to live. Mm. And so it, it, by mm. getting that answer to prayer, that reveals to Job, yes, you were right. This God mm. does care and he healed you too. You know? and, and so I think that's the argument I was trying to make. Does that mm -hmm. answer your question, Dee? Yes, yes, I, I understand. And I think you know, I think when we truly have a relationship with God and when we truly understand God's character, it, it really is not about the reward. It's not about mm. the end result of getting going up in heaven. It really, that's just like, that's honestly, as we are in the midst of our relationship with God and whether it's up or down, you know, whether it's struggles or it's just, you know, just peaceful, whatever it is, I think we're more really focused on just, having that relationship being in that relationship on a daily basis rather than oh yeah you know i i'm i want to stay with god i want to keep to abide in him uh, mm -hmm. just so that i can get to heaven i don't think really mm -hmm. uh, us really wanting truly having that relationship with god that reward is not even in our mind it's just something that we know it's there it's going to come someday but that's not where our focus is right and yeah. i think that Jacob, I'm not Jacob, a Job, you're describing that's where he was at. He was so sure mm. of his relationship. I mean, so sure of God's character, rather, uh, that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a slight movement now, and we're going to go deep into the clutches of hell. Um, <laughs> will, will you take us there, John? <laughs> Did you like my segue? Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for that. No problem. Hey, so Matthew, I really enjoyed your book. And um, I, I really liked your angle on Abraham and that first part. And then I like the way you kind of hit some main issues. Um, and, and I, I didn't think this would be the chapter that really, really made me struggle a bit. I but this uh, saying no to hell, I, I really liked what you did with that. Um, but I, I have to say that in the context, I've never been totally in touch with the way Avenus and Ellen White's approach to hell has been. I think in a lot of ways you had a, a little bit better clarification of, um, of a God of love, um, saying no to hell and a very good, um, way of kind of describing how it's not possible and that the, you know, the only things that end up in hell are the, um, you know, the three uh, beings from Revelation and then ultimately uh, death and Hades ends up getting destroyed in hell as well. Um, but just uh, to my point in, in something that really opened my eyes and I'm struggling with, honestly, um, and I just want a little bit of clarification with ultimately ends with what you were talking about with the open possibility. And the way I read it, and so we're clear in the back of the book saying no to hell is chapter 14. And the open possibility is just flat out stated in 278. But the section starts on page um, 271. Um, and I'm going to try to summarize it. You can certainly clarify it. But ultimately on 276, you talk about the nations and the kings basically being in heaven with the tree of life that is not only there for the nations, but for their healing. And, and that being after um, 
the destruction of these three creatures and death in Hades. And then you, you quote um, uh, Keith Giles and, and Rob Bell. And, and it's interesting because Rob Bell kind of approached a universalism kind of theology um, to some degree and got some criticism for that. And I think you, you're, you pulled back a little bit from that. Um, and then you brought up this, the open possibility. And it's interesting how this chapter on um, saying no to hell kind of almost goes hand in hand with this chapter on saying no to exclusivity. Um, and I didn't make that connection until I, I kind of reviewed some stuff. Um, but I was, I was impressed with, with this one quote on page 300. Uh, one, two, three, the third full paragraph down, down where it says, God gracious as always allows them, uh, these people that are in heaven and didn't necessarily believe in him, but were devoted to their own gods with little g's. Uh, so God gracious as always allows them their freedom to remain ignorant, inviting them merely to walk with him by imitating him. And, and I think your point is that more people are going to be saved than we realize. But I guess... I want a little bit of clarification on that, especially with this open possibility part and how that stays one step away from universalism where essentially everyone gets saved given enough time, you know, in the presence of God. So I think that uh, the major issue in my mind philosophically for why uh, universalism is, is so problematic as a topic is that essentially it's dependent on your view of free will and right. just how well we're adjusted. So imagine um, the following scenario and the dichotomy of views that can emerge. You have a daughter who is, um, daughter or son, doesn't matter, uh, who has- uh, One of each. Kind of, <laughs> some kind of, non-binary, uh, some kind of, uh, I don't know, like possession, mental illness that they become possessed to throw themselves in the fire. Right. This is even alluded to in the Bible, uh, where I think there's a parent who goes ahead and says they have a child who does this, uh, thrashes themselves over there. Now, imagine a parent sitting there going, well, my child has free will. If they want to thrash themselves into the fire, then um, that is their choice. I tried to resist. I tried to reach through to them and it just didn't work. Now, in that scenario, because we're aware that this person has mental illness, it doesn't make sense because mental illness right. isn't logical. And so you recognize that it's a sickness. And so you don't view the person's autonomy as sufficient and they can't make legal decisions. Certainly they can't make choices about their own livelihood. So they require a third, uh, a, a, you know, another party to actually make those decisions on their behalf, especially when they make decisions that are clearly in violation of whatever natural law or or expectations one would have for sanity. So, but then the other option, right, is um, that the parent stops the person because they believe they don't have that ability and they prevent it. So in some sense, you have to ask yourself, how bad is the effect of sin? Like, is right. it possible that God looks at humanity and sees us in the same way? And that while some of us say, I'm sane and that person is, uh, is insane, from God's perspective, it's a spectrum. <laughs> and he's like, well, you're still mentally ill. You're just, you're just the schizophrenic who can manage to go to work and you're the schizophrenic who is trapped inside his room. Um, and if, if that's the case, then you have an argument in some sense for universalism because then the issue's the odyssey, really. The question is, well, why hasn't God stepped in already? Right. If that's right. if that were that sin that sin hospitalized, then then why are we all suffering here with no ward with no nurses, nobody uh, taking care of the situation, getting us uh, healed, uh, no instant healing like Job. So that's one option. Then the other option would be something like, well, okay, we do have snowball, no barking. We do have um, some sort of uh, ability to make decisions, maybe fully, maybe limited in some way. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, it's probably something only God knows fully in terms of the capability because we do suffer from mental illness. We do obviously have things that prevent us even from making spiritual decisions. So in that sense, then probably uh, the question becomes down to what extent of free will is still untouched by sin 
And again, even then, it's probably something that directly relates to only God's knowledge. So, you know, no matter what, it becomes very hard for uh, us to look at the issue of saved, not saved as anything less than children on a playground fighting over who started it. Um, you know, like the, mm-hmm. the teacher's like, you're both guilty. <laughs> I'm, done, I'm done with this. Like, you know, uh, there's no winner here. Um, and in some sense, that was the message of Jesus. But the thing is, when you look at eschatology, the reason it's called the open possibility was a theology teacher of mine that actually phrased it that way, is that ultimately God is viewed as ultimate morality, right? God is the ultimate judge. God is the one who, you know, or even in Adventist tradition, God is the one who first gets judged. The books right, get right. opened and it's God in the great controversy who we look to say, did you do it right? right? right. So God has to pass that test. So, and that's the affirmation of faith that God is love and love will pass that test. If that's the case, then again, God alone is going to be able to come up with that evaluation of the situation and have the answer we're looking for. So you can't, I kind of resist, uh, I wonder if it's even within human potentiality to make that argument. I'm certainly not capable of thinking like a sort of uh, Bentley Hart, to, to make David Bentley Hart, to make an argument that says outright, it has to be that it's universalism. And I'm also not comfortable with ignoring large swaths of scripture to argue it's all annihilationism. Everyone gets wiped out in the end um, mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, if you have any sin. So it becomes this question of, well, there's clearly texts in the Bible that suggest this openness, but then there's also plenty of texts that suggest people will resist. And I guess the best way to think about it is this, in order for Hitler or at least the best way I think of it right now, in order for Hitler to come to a point where if he was to suddenly be shown the pearly gates and uh, the Jewish St. Peter is sitting there looking at him going, hi, uh, the only way, you know, yarmulke maybe even for good effect, the only way that that Hitler is going to want to enter a city built by Jews, uh, built by the, uh, the, the Jewish Christ, which he hated the cross, wanted to get rid of it, right. thought it was, Jesus was the worst. Um, and it, the only way he's going to get in there and be like, I have to spend all eternity with Judaism. <laughs> I have to spend all eternity with, 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 okay. I mean, it might just be hell for him. Like, and I mean, right. it might be so bad. Like you've heard people say, and there, there are cases of this where if somebody has to be saved by their enemy, they, they will actually be like, I don't want to live. Just let me die. Like this, may, this means so much to me. It sounds absurd. The, mm-hmm. the question, I guess, is the only way that can happen is if there's some divine contingency plan to fix that, to somehow, mm-hmm. like you'd have to have something that, that makes the healing process occur for Hitler to be able to not have a living hell that makes him want to kill himself for being there. I mean, literally the guy already killed himself when he thought he would get caught. I Mm -hmm. I imagine this idea of the new Jerusalem sounds more hellish than pulling, you know, the trigger while in a bunker. So, you know, I think that that becomes the problem. Do you think that God is going to do that? Or do you think that God's going to honor that request? And then the other aspect of this is to think, is there a possibility that at some point there just can't be repentance at some, and it's not because God isn't willing, but it's because you've gone so far that you wouldn't want it. And there's nothing that could convince you. And I, you know, I think of like the blasphemy of the Holy spirit where the real, you know, the way that Mark and Matthew and Luke uh, define it in the controversies with Jesus is Jesus goes ahead and says, basically, you think I have a demon. You look at, at me, the, 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 the representation of God and you say, you're demonic, you're Satan, right? Like, okay, that like reminds you of Isaiah 5. Woe to those who call evil good, good evil, those who exchange light for darkness. You switch the whole thing. And so really at that point, it's not unforgivable because God won't forgive you. It's unforgivable because you won't accept repentance. Right, right. You wouldn't accept it. You're, you, you live in such a different world now. Like the whole thing's upside down. So I just kind of think that, uh, this question is mucky, even in the Bible, just because it's so contingent on that final review of God's character. But I do mm-hmm. hope, and what I wanted to emphasize in the book, is that other side of the equation beyond annihilation is there in scripture. Mm-hmm. And it needs to be acknowledged. And I didn't do it in the book, but there are even two unique texts by Jesus in the gospels 
that talk about hell in a way that is totally different right. from you know uh, anything that we hear about Mark nine forty nine, where Jesus goes ahead and says, um, "Everyone will be salted with fire." And, 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 and it's shocking, not only because it is in the context of the final judgment, and he says everyone, righteous, unrighteous alike, and fire in this context only can refer to, uh, you know, the judgment. He's made that clear in the context. And it's a good thing. Right. He he's not saying everyone goes to hell and they all burn in the lake of fire, but he, he says everyone's salted and the salting will produce the final, like, the final revealing of your character, or whatever. And then you have in Luke's gospel, he ends a parable where he goes ahead and says, um, some will be, some servants will be, uh, will be uh, punished longer than others. Mm. But the text leads you to assume they come out of the punishment. They continue in, in, right. in discipline. Those are two judgment texts that almost never get cited in conversation, despite the fact that what they suggest is that we really don't understand the judgment. And I think it's because we're so wrapped up in the mechanics, we lose sight of the character of God. And mm -hmm. the mechanics are, are <laughs> what we get to review, but it's the character of God that is going to de determine whether we can have a Job-like faith and be able to rest assured that we know the kind of God we serve. And so we can trust in the process that will proceed from that character, from that love. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's what you meant by, you said it, it seems clear that John and Revelation has something closer in mind to annihilation, if not the possibility of reconciliation. And that kind of, I, I think you described that better here, because in the book, you, you move on to, you know, rather than the popular idea of an eternally burning place of torment. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like what you said, it's, it has more to do with the character of God and probably our reconciliation with with that more than the actual process of the judgment mm -hmm. itself. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad I could. We, we are, we have a big enemy against us on this pages to progress episode. And that is the enemy of time. Um, it is fighting against us. I'm going to try and wrap things up with a very broad question, um, that will hopefully touch on a few elements. Um, and the question pertains to the wider reading of the book, Matthew. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us some insights specifically, um, throughout the book, there is a specific purpose of the Bible that obviously you have in your mind as to why the Bible is there and what, what its function has in us, in our everyday lives. My question pertains if you want you can shed some insight into the purpose of the bible but my question is more geared towards the notion of um you presented the premise of this entire book a challenge for us read the bible more faithfully you quote faithfully um and your method of implementation was quite a radical robust honest and brutal reading of scripture that really just enables us to not only take it for face value, but to recognize there are some nuances behind actual contextual reading uh, for the then and for the now. So based, based upon all of that, if we were to assume your premise of reading the Bible faithfully, my question is broader, um, and it is this, how much does reading the Bible faithfully hinge on our salvation in relation to god that's my question to you how much does reading the bible faithfully hinge on our salvation want to have a crack at that yeah i think that where i would in my opinion locate the <laughs> salvific effect of how we read the bible is in its effect on our characters and how we're molded so you know i mean i alluded to that in the divine violence chapter right where um <sighs> Sorry about my dog. It's I'm just right. noticing he has scattered treats all over the floor. He keeps forgetting about them because he barks and then he comes <laughs> over and wants more. So that makes me feel good. He hasn't been spoiled completely. I just have to pick them up and then restart again. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, uh, imagine uh, you know some of the examples of people who read the Bible and got the message, I should go murder people. I should go kill. I should go do, right? Uh, Rabbi 
Daniel Hartman, I think I quoted him in one place where, you know, uh, the Bible has low hanging fruit and the devil is more than happy to be uh, handing it out. Um, and it's, it's a, it's an interesting problem because again, it's like, well, yeah, I think the proof's in the pudding, the image of God you have that can lead you to say, and I, I, I had a conversation with uh, a Calvinist, uh, and not that all Calvinists are like this, but we're pretty radical Calvinists. He's like, yes, God would want me to kill my kid if he's disobedient. He didn't have any children as far as I'm aware. Um, but but he, he was convinced because he read in the Bible, he read in Leviticus, you know, stone your disobedient child. God's will doesn't change. God is, God is coherent. So he goes, no, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I know that I'm not going to break the laws of the United States and do it, but, you know, I definitely think that that's moral. That's fine. I think it's in the, those examples one finds the effect, salvific, negative, and positive, in how the Bible affects one, in the sense that there's this very real worldly effect on a person's character and soul that has ramifications in the actions they take that would affect the judgment that God gives them. And, 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 and remember when Jesus says that there's all these people who come up and say, you know, oh, didn't we do all these great things in your name? Didn't we... Yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some Islamic jihadists in there as well going, didn't we blow up this mosque in your name and do, you know, at some point you have to think like God's sitting there going, yeah, no, I you never knew me. That, that was that was not me, right? In the same way Jesus turns in John 8 to the Pharisees and Sadducees and say, you're trying to kill me. That doesn't, that means you don't understand God. You, you're not like Abraham. So I think that that's a huge effect in that regards, in ter terms of salvation, how it molds us, how we view God is going to affect then how those texts are going to mold us in our character. Are we going to become mini Christ? Well, mm. not if our vision of Christ, I mean, we may not want to, if our vision of Jesus is so contrary to who Jesus is uh, mm. and who Jesus' heart was. We can have a very deformed view of who God is mm. and it could lead us wrong in so many directions. So I think that's a, a huge problem to avoid. And I think that that's the value of why one wants to faithfully read, right? What, where does faith come from? In the Bible, faith is not related to belief. Faith is related, and throughout the Reformation, it was understood this relatively well. Faith is related to trust. It's related to an understanding that I have faith. Like, I have faith in my mm -hmm. wife. I don't believe my wife. Like, okay, that's I trust my wife. So mm -hmm. the idea then is it's much deeper. This is to read the Bible faithfully. One has to trust that the God that they're, you know, worshiping, that they're reading about, that they're experiencing through scripture does look accurate, does, does look right mm -hmm. in the sense that they can have that trusting relationship. And I think the fact that the Bible is written by humans, it, it just reflects the fact that each person's experience of God is different. And because there's all these minor differences, it allows for somebody to come to the Bible. And as Ellen White, you know, and, and many other people have noted, just about mm -hmm. anything you want to prove from the Bible can be proven, right? Mm -hmm. You go to it with, the, with an agenda, you can demonstrate it. Well, that doesn't mean there's a weakness with the Bible. It means that there's a weakness in regards to, or an importance in regards to what you start out with mm. or what you're looking for. What is your, your standard setting point? Um, I know that, that I, I think I pretty much answered that question. If you would let me, there's one thing I wanted to add to that mm. um, from the chapter on saying no to divine violence, because I noticed it wasn't brought up. Mm. Um, and uh, it's on page 247. And it actually, it was, it was a comment that Joe made uh, on one of the, um, uh, it was a comment that uh, Joe made in regards to, um, this was before the final chapter, but he was like, well, how do you figure out what is the criteria? How do you understand what it is you're supposed to be doing um, mm -hmm. in regards to, how, how could you do this and be faithful to scripture without it just being your ego that guides what you think is right or wrong? And I, I've always appreciated Joe's critiques because they've been really on point in regards to all the possible weaknesses that this could go down. And there are many. I mean, you know, uh, Jacob doesn't fight God uh, trepidatiously, I would hope. So when, um, or lightly, I mean, he should fight him trepidatiously. Uh, so when we look at, uh, you know, the final chapter, some people can read it 
and I mean, that's my fault. And it's not, not anyone's fault for reading. I should have made these points much larger, but someone could read it and think to themselves, oh, so it's just all about love and, and good and great vibes. And this is, this is how you understand uh, Jesus. And, and this is how you uh, read the Bible, whatever seems to agree with your modern sense of love and ideas. It's not, it, it could come off that way, but really the secret was revealed in 247, uh, to 248 and the reason uh, establishing a criteria and this actually later on in my academic book I've been writing um, really got expanded to you know the defining idea and that is um, I say we must establish a criteria to allow us to make such an assertion as so in the context it was about divine violence did God act violently uh, seemingly against love did he do something else so we must establish a criteria essentially what we must do is recognize that God is logically coherent um, and that his actions will as such not be contradictory and i didn't list it here but the reason is because of like the text in malachi where it clearly says i am you know I, i'm i am god i do not change i'm not a human um, and yet in the bible he changes all the time in regards to what actions he decides to take the verb for change is used all the time but never about god's character god's character unchanging always the actions he chooses for a circumstance might change, but not who he is at his core. So, uh, you know, part of the problem here is you kind of end up committing blasphemy if you think that God is going to change, if God mm -hmm. is going to become incoherent. And then also God says, I'm not the author of confusion, which is a really ancient way of saying I'm not contradictory. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't do things arbitrarily. I'm not somebody who's going to be viewed and said, well, I can't figure you, you know, out a pattern here. And that's important because then it means that when you're reading scripture uh, and you're reading about God, you have to be able to determine a pattern and because otherwise you run the risk of thinking wrong of God. Like if Moses had been there and said, oh yeah, God, uh, I accept everything you said. Here's all the blasphemies he would have committed. I believe God changes and goes back on his promises. I believe that God is willing to do things that look evil. I believe that God is willing to turn his back on those who follow. And Way more problems. Ellen White gets into this. Ellen White argues in several places that it, it was Moses's uh, responsibility as a prophet to reject what God was saying. If he didn't, he wouldn't be a prophet. He would, not have, he would have not passed the test uh, that she says. And that's important because it means that we have to recognize, in some sense, we have an obligation to find non-contradictoriness. In other words, the danger of, of Joe, kind of like the way in which you would at times say, well, I don't understand the mystery, and so I'm going to, wh why not just accept that maybe this is loving? The danger is that you're willing to kind of allow for God to appear contradictory uh, in order to satisfy not handling those issues uh, mm -hmm. at, or trying to make the risk of taking that stand. And the key issue in all these stories is God doesn't do that. God, I mean, not God, uh, Moses, Jacob, the other, Job, they all end up making a stand. They all have to make a very dangerous stand as to who is God and risk the consequence <laughs> of, am I wrong or am I right? And that only comes from that life of faith, only comes from understanding who God has been for so long. But in that chapter on page 247, I say, um, it basically asks, how would we as humans know whether something was logically coherent? Um, and I mentioned divine command theory, but um, the question is, God and morality, I argue, must be logically consistent, coherent. Either they're unified or they're against each other. So the fact that God invites humans to fight, disagree, question with him, demonstrates that the God depicted in the Bible expects humans to be able to distinguish contradictions and reject them when tested. Uh, Jacob has to be able to w say, this is not what you, you, this is snowball, leave it. Look, treat, treat. <laughs> oh, he got really possessed now. Snowball. Uh, it kind of comes down to the question of you, Moses has to know who God is well enough to say, I reject this new possibility. Mm. And so uh, that means that any attempt to argue a human cannot judge, coherency is to be rejected. And if you met some Calvinists, they will argue that. They'll, and some evangelicals, they'll say, humans are so marred by sin, there's no ability. Snowball, no barking. Here, treat. Treat. Let's see if that, no, wow, he is so possessed, he won't even. 
go up for the treat. Oh, now he's come back. Okay. Um, but basically, God is so possessed. You have to be so possessed by understanding God's spirit and know it that uh, you're able to reject uh, anything that contradicts who God is. And that goes against the stream of thought where some people say, well, humans are so marred by sin, they can't know. They can't understand what's right and wrong. If that's the case, then the whole Bible's point is useless because the whole Bible is filled with examples. And the examples are not like childlike stories that tell you at the end, and here's the moral. This is what you're supposed to do. They, they sometimes are very vague. Sometimes you have contradictory reasons given like in Genesis for some of the stories uh, and you kind of have to sit there and go, well, who's right, Jacob or his sons? <laughs> they both had an answer as to Dinah's rape. Which one, which one is the correct one? Is neither the correct one? Sometimes you don't know what the answer is going to be. And I think that's important because it means you do have a responsibility and God wants to engage that. That's why he calls the people Israel, you know, those who are going to struggle fight with God. But at the same time, that fighting isn't, you know, to Dee's concern, that fighting is not something that comes out as, I just want to, you know, wrestle with God. I just want to give him a good punch. I'm, I'm angry. I mean, maybe God's willing to take that, but that's not, that isn't the point. The point is that your fighting is revealed in um, your willingness to fight against what is clearly not who God is your desire to say, like, you know, if somebody mars the reputation of your spouse and says, well, actually they're an evil, you know, SOB. You're gonna be like, no, don't talk about my spouse that way. You have no right. No, this, mm -hmm. is, this is not the case, right? It's why Ellen White was so animate about hell is that you're marring who God's character is by portraying him like he's Satan. We have to speak out against that. So this is a fight, you know, to use ancient ideas of fighting and wrestling but it's just imagery to describe defending uh, and knowing who God is and being willing to take a stand for it. And I think that ultimately that's what good scripture is all about, is having us read the Bible with an eye for who God's character is, reading it in light of the great controversy, reading it in light of Jesus and what he tried to point us towards in the Father's love on the cross. Yeah. Sorry, really thank you does. for the, the extra time. No, it's fine. It's no, fine. It good. brings us. It brings us to a close. Um, probably disappointed that we couldn't ask any more questions, but 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 it it helped us to be able to just cover a really broad theme, thematic view of the entire book. I will say, Matthew, it's it's been an absolute pleasure to read your book. Um, yeah, and really I, was. And I think it, it, it definitely helped us to engage in a conversation with God in ways that we may not have been used to before. And I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I, I don't know if that was some of the views that everyone else here as well feel the same way. But we, we definitely um, had moments where we lifted a few eyebrows. We had moments where we praised God. And we were just like, wow, this is really remarkable to see the expression of God. One thing is for sure, as I'll try and wrap this up. The complexities of human experience that are that are documented in the Bible that you have reflected on um, run directly parallel to the complexities of our own individual human experiences and how God is so involved in every single aspect of that. And I think you brought that out. I think you 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 put it out there, the ugliness, the beautiness. Uh, the beautiness, the beautifulness of it. Um, and and you, you just showed us that God literally just walks in amongst of all of that human experience. I think if there's one thing for sure is God is after the heart of mankind and he wants us to be able to turn in close to him. So with that, unfortunately, with a million and one questions, we bring things to a close, but we hope and pray um, that at least our listeners who have interacted with all the episodes pertaining to this book and this final episode with you the author that our listeners have walked away with something that they can go deeper into his word and into his love as a result of that so i'm going to bring things to a close with a prayer um, i want to thank everyone who has been a part of this series on pages to progress um, let's pray we'll bring things to a close and then we'll We'll, we'll, we'll say our goodbyes. Father, we want to thank you so much that you are a God who has not given up on us as human beings. Lord, today, my prayer is that for us as participants in this series and those who have been online on this journey, 
uh, that we can be people who do not give up on understanding what it is you have for us as individuals. Tonight, as we bring a close to this conversation, we do not bring a close to the relationship that we are gearing for, a relationship where you are there with your open arms, wanting us to be able to pull in closer to you. Take our questions, take our confidence, take our doubts, and will you please perform great miracles with them, Lord? Father, I want to thank you for being a faithful God to us. Teach us to learn to be faithful in our pursuit of loving you and understanding you and growing in relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Matthew, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out yeah, to be thank with you. us. It um, was a pleasure. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for taking the time to read the book. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm glad you had fun uh, reading it. I had fun watching you discuss reading it. And uh, this has been just a, a joy to be able to, to get the time to talk with all of you. Really, truly. Excellent. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. This is the end of our Pages of the Progress um, episodes for this book. We're going to take a short break. We will be back in a week or two with a new book. So keep posted on our YouTube page. But from us here this evening, we're saying good night for now. And we shall see you soon on our new book, whatever, wherever God leads us to. So this is John, D, Joe, myself, and Matthew saying good night to everyone. God bless you. <laughs>